So, so we don't need to implement like fork or. You only need to implement the system calls listed in the lab right. Oh, okay. Uh, fork it. and wait and exit or lab two. Oh, okay. That's it. Can you just clarify what a endpoint is? Uh, yes. So, an inode. Is a file system data structure that maintains information about uh, where actually on the disk is the file's data, what permissions are there to access this file, things like that. Um, and if I were to look in um, this uh, fs.h, where this file struct is defined. It has an inode inside of it. So I could look at the definition of that. All sorts of stuff going on here. We'll get into some of this when we talk about file systems later in the course. Uh, for this lab, uh, the only uh, uh, the only interaction that you would have with the inode is to implement the fstat system call. Uh, you need to put some information into the fstat struct that the user passes in. Some of that information comes out of the inode. But uh, the inode is for example, keeping track of kind of which block of data on the disk uh, the file is stored in, what the type of the file is, how many bytes it is, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, since these questions, uh, some other questions have come up in office hours, should mention them now. Uh, so for a number of the system calls that you are implementing, such as FS open file, there are a bunch of different error conditions that the system call needs to handle, your sysopen needs to handle. However, one of the things that your sysopen does is it calls the file system function fs open file. And you can look at the list of different errors that fs open file handles, and anything it handles, your sysopen would not need to handle. And that's going to be true for most of those. Uh, different conditions. You're not going to be uh, checking whether a directory exists. Uh, you're not going to be doing anything with the flags or the mode. FS open file handles all of that. Um, the main things that your uh, uh, system calls will be doing uh, is making sure the user passed in good arguments. So. One of the arguments the user passes in when they call open is this pointer to a character, a uh, string in C. And so you would need to use the provided validate string on that pointer to, to check, does this actually point to valid memory uh, before you hand it off to the kernel? Because what we don't want to happen is for the user passes in a bad argument, the kernel tries to use it, the kernel panics, the whole system shuts down. Because one process passed one bad argument to a system call. We want 
the kernel to recognize this argument as bad and return an appropriate error code. Uh, so there's uh, a kind of error fault that you return if the argument is bad and If there's no more file descriptors, that array of open files is completely full. That's a failure to allocate memory, and so you should return error no memory. Some other folks have asked how to get started. Uh, the Lab writers always mention the files that the reference system, uh, the reference solution uh, involved changing. Uh, the place to start is in proc.h. We have our process control block, our struct that keeps track of all the data for a particular process. You need to add an array of open files. That's an array of pointers to file structs to this structure. In proc.c, there is a function proc init, init that initializes all the parts of this proc structure. Your array of open files will need to be initialized there, things set to null or set to point to standard in or standard out. And aside from those two things, all the rest of the changes will be in uh, syscall.c, filling in those, those different functions. Any questions on that, David? Um, I think you suggested that we should uh, implement like function alloc, like FD. Like, uh, when should we use it? Like how? Uh, so, the this is uh, uh, just a suggestion, but the um, the lab design document suggests implementing two helper functions that will be used in a bunch of these different system calls. So helpful to have them defined in one place rather than code copy pasted. Alloc FD, Valid FD, Valid FD, super simple. It's checking the FD, the integer, it's an index into the array of open files. This function should make sure that it's a valid index before the kernel goes on to use it. So between zero and however, whatever the, the length of the array is. So that's valid. Alloc FD as the design document describes, is for when we have a new file that we want to put into our file table. And allocfd is responsible for finding what slot that file should go into. That is the first available slot is what it's supposed to do. So that if you have initialized all the slots that aren't used to null, it should find the first slot that's null, put uh, assign the pointer there to whatever uh, its argument is. It should take in a, a file struct pointer, uh, and then it should return the index uh, of that location or return error no mem if it couldn't find an open spot. Does that make sense? So like we should use it in like different function in, the, in syscall, I guess? You should use it when, yes, you would, you, you would define it and use it in syscall.c, and you would use it when you are opening a new file. So, so, so validate.fd is just validating an integer. It's not going into the files and looking at whether that file is valid. That's right. It's the user has passed in a file descriptor. Uh -huh. We never trust the user. Uh -huh. They may have passed in uh, a negative number. They may have passed in... Uh, a huge number that's going to cause a memory error if we try and use it as an index. So we just want to make sure before we use this integer as an index into our array of open files that it's actually going to correspond to a slot in that chunk of memory. Other questions? All right. So, today's topic is 
uh, how mechanically do we actually transfer control uh, from uh, the user to the kernel or from the kernel to the user? We can go, we want to be able to go in both directions. And so, what's, what's a situation, what, what's a reason we want to go from kind of running in user mode to, to running in kernel? We just to execute a privileged command. Yeah, we we want to we want to do it to execute some privileged ins instruction. Uh, what's an example of uh, uh, maybe a kind of a higher level idea of what a, a user process might do to try and get a privileged instruction executed? Like temporarily disable the interrupt timer. So. Uh, We'll talk about, we will need to do some disabling of, uh, uh, of interrupts, but uh, Sebastian? Like writing the file to desk? Yeah, so that's an example of a kind of operation that we would uh, uh, need to ask the kernel to do, for which we would need to transfer from user to kernel mode. What is writing a file to disk an example? Well, what's a bigger category? System call. Yeah, so making a system call is one of the instances where we're going to switch from user mode to kernel mode. Uh, the term for when uh, the user, uh, user process sort of deliberately, synchronously transfers control to the kernel, came up last time, call that a track. Is there another uh, Type of uh, type of thing we talked about last time, where control would switch from user to kernel. Aiden? Interrupt. And interrupt. So this is asynchronous. The user process didn't execute some instruction that caused an interrupt to uh, occur as a direct consequence but some outside event is interrupting the user process and transferring control over to the kernel. Timer interrupts being an important example. The third category that I haven't mentioned yet, which is some kind of processor exception. So, one example of this would be user process uh, executes an instruction that causes an integer division by zero. That's a no-no. Processor exception occurs, and that turns control over to the kernel to decide what to do about this exception. One cool example of a process exception processor exception is this is how breakpoints in something like GDB are implemented. What is actually happening is the kernel is replacing the instruction where the breakpoint is with a special instruction, a different one, that will cause a processor exception at which point the handler for that exception changes the instruction back to the original one and then transfers control over to the debugger. So the way that we actually set up a specific instruction where the program is going to stop is by getting the processor to raise uh, uh, an exception at that point. Questions on these user to kernel? We also will need to be able to go from kernel to user. So thoughts on when we would need to transfer from kernel mode to user mode? Daryl. After finishing a system 
Exactly. When we're resuming from a syscall or an interrupt or a processor exception, once we're finished doing whatever we needed to do for that, we want to resume with whatever user process was currently running, and we need to transfer from current mode back to user mode. Other ideas of when we might need to transfer <coughs> kernel mode to user mode? Sebastian, I guess when you're starting an application. Exactly. The kernel needs to create and initialize a process and then actually needs to transfer control to that process uh, to get it to start running. Sort of uh, related to a new process, it's another uh, operating system function that involves similar, we need to go from kernel back, back to user. Oh, yeah. Would it be changing between processes? Yep. Part of that context switch process. We're running some user process. Uh, it's time to switch from uh, that process to another, maybe due to a timer interrupt. Uh, but then we need to, when we're done, kind of switching over the various parts of the data, uh, the, the kernel data to run this other process, transfer back to that user process. All right, so these are our main reasons why we're kind of going into or out of uh, kernel mode. And so the way that we're going to, uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to look at what are the steps involved from going, going from user mode to kernel mode. And then going in this other direction is basically undoing those steps, going and just reversing them. So from a kind of design perspective, uh, to implement mode transfer, transferring from uh, user to kernel uh, mode or kernel to user mode, there are kind of Uh, three features which uh, we might think of kind of, these are the minimum, the, the, the fundamental things this mode transfer needs to accomplish uh, in the operating system. So first, is we want to provide limited entry to the kernel, meaning that we want user processes to only be able to enter the kernel at specific points, not arbitrary points. So we have this kind of specific, narrow, controlled pathway for user processes to get into, get into the kernel. Another thing that we really care about is atomic changes to processor state. Does anyone remember what atomic means? All or nothing? Yeah, all or nothing. We want these changes to be indivisible. These, there's a set of changes we need to make to the processor state, such as kind of switching which memory we're using, switching where our instruction pointer is, like the address of the next instruction we're going to run, switching which mode we're in, kernel uh, or user, these set of changes to the process state need to be atomic. We can't have something happen in the middle of them because the system would be in an inconsistent state and very strange or bad things might occur. 
and the third is transparent restartable execution. And that just means if we stop some user process to go do something in the kernel, it needs to be the case that we can resume running our user process as if nothing had happened. We want these, these transfer to be transparent. The user process should not be able to tell that we went into the kernel and back. And we need to save whatever state we need to save on the user side to be able to restart our user process exactly where it left off. Do each of these make sense? What are your questions on this? All right, so these are our kind of big picture goals. And so let's start to get into how do we actually implement these. And as usual, it's going to be a combination of hardware and software uh, that, that makes this happen. So the few, few mechanisms that we'll, we'll use is something called an interrupt vector table. So here's the question. Uh, when an interrupt occurs, how do we know what code we should go run as a result of that interrupt? So it's been uh, 50 microseconds, our timer interrupt has gone off. Right? How do we know what function we should call, we should go run, when this interrupt happens? And so the basic idea, we're going to have a table that we're just going to look up which function to go to go from. So we're gonna have some special register on our CPU it's going to point to the start of this interrupt vector table. And the entries in this table are going to be the addresses of the functions we'll use to uh, say handle a timer interrupt or handle dividing by zero or even handle a system call. And in this sense, the name interrupt vector table is uh, slightly misleading because we'll, ha we'll reserve a particular spot in this table, one for a system call, and others will be reserved for processor exceptions. So this is actually all the fun, which is, for example, dividing by zero. So all of these entries, which will be set up when the system boots up, because we don't ever want our system running before this thing exists, because otherwise we wouldn't know what to do when an interrupt happens. So as the system is booting up, we're going to put this uh, interrupt table 
in memory and put in a special register the address where this table is. Victor, I have a question. Uh, the reading reference something very similar, but called it the trap table. Are those the same thing? Those are the same. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So the um, the OSV code calls this the, the vector table, but interrupt vector table, trap table, all the same. Thing. Good question. What other questions? So the existence of this interrupt vector table means that whenever some interrupt or, or system call or processor exception occurs, along with that we will need some index into this table. And so this is uh, defined by the hardware, like an x86 processor uses a specific index for divide by zero, uses a specific index for system calls, and, and so on. Uh, so that when that interrupt occurs, kind of jump to the table and then start executing the function pointed to there. That's how we know what code to execute. But if we're executing a function to handle some interrupt, we, that gives rise to a couple additional questions. transparent, restartable execution of these interrupts, I mentioned we need to save relevant state from the user process, but we need to answer the question, where do we save that state? Where in memory do we put this state from the user process? And also, these handlers, they're just functions. And we know that as a function executes, it may need space on a stack somewhere in memory. And so where is that stack that the kernel is going to use when executing these handlers? Where is that going to be? Could we just use the user processes stack? So I think this is actually an, an interesting question. So I'd like you to, to take a few minutes and uh, brainstorm with your neighbors, perhaps pros and cons or potential benefits or flaws if we just, the user process, whatever was running, has a stack, just putting stuff there. Uh, all right. It sounds like uh, some, some good discussion, thoughts on Good idea, bad idea, somewhere in between. So obviously I don't know, but one thing that we were thinking is we would use the user stack. And the reason that would be is because because it's a stack, by nature the stack can just put on the value you need to use for the new handler and you know the place that you it off because whenever you pop off all the stuff that you use for the handler, you'll know like exactly where the previous process or the previous user process ended. Yeah, if we pushing new stuff, will not interfere with the things the user has on the stack and the stack, so we can we can pop them off. Uh, so so in that way, we could use our user stack without uh, worrying about overwriting data from the user. Oh. So I think issue with like. Because I'm assuming the kernel is going to have its own 
virtual memory somewhere, because that's like store some things. And in that case, that page table won't work for the user's page table, so I have to like load in the two separate page tables. I feel like I want to get the data back, you have to like know where it is, which you won't you have to like load in that page table to figure out where it is. Uh, Yeah, so maybe we already need separate kernel memory. And if we already have separate kernel memory sitting around that we need to reference, using that and the user stack at the same time might get pretty complicated. Is that what you were yeah. getting at? Yeah, I, I do think that this, depending on exactly what we have in this memory and when we need it, yeah, using the user stack could could end up being way more trouble than this than it's worth. Uh, we talked about security and that maybe, and even though not, there's nothing inherently like necessarily dangerous about it, there's storing stuff as sensitive as like how the kernel is going to be running just to, in user space and user like that that just seems dangerous. Yeah, I, I agree. This this is kind of the big warning sign to me that maybe we keep track of all the memory we use. Maybe we do the extra work of writing zero to every byte of it before we go back to the user mode. But maybe that's not perfect and we leak kernel data to the user, or maybe it just like creates a lot of overhead cleaning out the kernel data from the user stack. Because if we put it on the user stack, even if this, the stack pointer is back to where it left off, doesn't mean some uh, villainous user process wouldn't just use the knowledge that the kernel had been using its memory to try and go uh, read data. It should. Other, other thoughts that came up in your discussion? Sebastian? It seems awkward to use a stack associated with a particular process to handle context switching to a different process. I don't know for sure that, that would cause problems, but that just seems like, I don't know. Yeah, that, that we, um, that it does, it does seem like the kernel is operating at sort of a distinct level from the user process. That's how, what it's doing conceptually. And so, yeah, it seems like just maybe a little weird to have it not have separate memory. Uh, particularly for operations that might not just involve a single process. Other thoughts? I guess I would put one one other kind of benefit up here. This user stack, it already exists. We've already allocated it. It's memory that's there. Uh, and so in some sense, it might be nice to just be able to use memory that's, that's already there. But for uh, some of the reasons we, we've outlined, where operating systems are not going to use the user stack uh, to, to keep track of this stuff. But I think there, there could be some benefits, so, so worth considering as a, as a design question. So what we will actually do is just have two stacks. for each process, a user stack and a kernel stack. And we might have the user stack. It started running main and then called function foo. So this would be user that I'll draw in white. And then the kernel stack. If user stack pointer is here, kernel stack is empty. Kind of user process is running normally, kernel stack not being used. When a process is 
So this would be when the process is running. When the process is not running, but kind of ready to run, it's waiting for its turn. Uh, maybe it was interrupted, paused at foo. Then our kernel stack is where we will save the user process state. And finally, if if our user process is waiting for, say, some uh, to for uh, reading a file from the disk, foo has called. Uh, a system call to ask it to read a file for a disk. Some part of that system call, and we'll see this in detail, it needs to be in user mode to sort of, the, it calls a user function that then initiates this transfer to, to kernel mode. And our kernel stack will have our saved user state. <coughs> the handler for this system call, and then perhaps also if it then needs to call some function in the driver, in the software that actually describes how to read data from this particular model of hard drive, that would also be, that function would also be used in the kernel stack. Yeah. Um, just like, just to make sure, um, where are these um, two stacks located? Are those like in the uh, process block or? Uh, so these are just chunks of uh, virtual memory. So there's, uh, uh, and they're kind of both living in memory together. Uh, and, but the addresses of the kernel's memory are protected. That is, the OS will not allow user code to read data as those addresses. So why does it need an entire stack? Couldn't it just have enough space to hold all the registries, hold a pointer to the handler, and hold a pointer to like, the rest of the driver code? So what if our handler has local variables that need to go on the stack? Got like the handler being a function might need stack space somewhere. Um, like the, the handler code or the driver code, whatever functions these call, will need, will operate using a stack the same way any other function does. And so we need space in memory somewhere. But if you, if you just have like a pointer to the handler, you could run that handle, like you could run that handler in your dedicated single kernel stack or whatever, you know? So you're saying let's have one kernel stack for the whole system? Yeah. Yes, so actually early versions of Unix when memory was uh, very scarce did exactly that. One kind of uh, kernel stack shared by all processes uh, turns out it much, uh, much simpler in implementation if we have just a, kind of, uh, a two stacks per process. And these days, memory is not scarce. And so the simplicity of this approach uh, is preferred over saving some memory by having just one kernel stack. Oh. Where's like the handle before it goes in the stack? Like, where does it get the handle from? Is it from, like, the disk, or...? So, uh, at boot, the OS kernel code, which will include these handlers, will be loaded into memory. Okay. And so this interrupt table will have pointers to the locations in memory where the code for each handler is. Is it, like, a physical memory location, or virtual? Uh, so, I mean, it's in, in some sense, that's sort of a, a not a, like a detail that, that's very, uh, that's would affect kind of how this behaves. Um, probably a virtual okay. memory address, and then when that's, when the instruction at that address is 
loaded in, the kind of usual address translation takes place. And the oh, so is the CPU state there at the bottom of the kernel stack? Mm -hmm. Is that the stuff that's also stored in the process control block? So the David said like all the CPU state, the register context is all stored in the process control block. For, yeah, for so when an interrupt happens. Yeah, so there. Uh, so the context in the process control block. Um, comes into play when we are doing the kind of context switch. Um, and so this CPU state is, um, yeah, so I guess I guess I would say uh, that you wouldn't necessarily need, need to maintain it in, in both places. Uh, the operating system might also maintain it in both places. Uh, because kind of sa saving, pushing the state onto the stack and then popping it off is a nice way to implement this sort of transfer. Um, uh, and, but any, I'm kind of speaking at a sort of general level of, of design, any specific system might have it in one or, or both places. Okay. <coughs> Other questions? All right, so and with these two mechanisms are uh, two kernel and user stack for process and our uh, interrupt table, uh, we can kind of put it together And look at what are the steps involved in doing this user to kernel mode transfer uh, in uh, an x86 system. So the first step is to turn off interrupts. Because while we're doing this transfer, we don't want another interrupt to come in that's part of making the, the set of operations atomic, because we don't want anything to interrupt it. Last time I said disable interrupts, this time I'm writing mask to emphasize that this doesn't ignore interrupts, it simply delays them until the interrupts are re-enabled or unmasked. And the, uh, this, this verb mask, uh, also gets it that this is an operation at the level of bits. There's a register somewhere, and where the bits are one, those interrupts are allowed. When the bits are zero, those interrupts are delayed. And so we mask interrupts by kind of putting zeros across this whole register and say, okay, we're delaying all interrupts until, uh, until some later time. The system has a limited capacity to kind of build up a, a record of what interrupts have occurred. And so if they're m delayed for too long, we're going to start losing them. And so for interrupts, particularly for uh, I.O. interrupts that may take a long time to complete, interrupts will be mass for only part of that so that we don't kind of lose a bunch of important events uh, by ignoring interrupts for, for a long period of time. So our first step, mask interrupts. Next step is going to be to save kind of key processor state. There's going to be uh, a few specific registers, our stack pointer, the address of the top of the stack, E flags, which is a register short for execution flags. It has things like are we in user or kernel mode? What was the result of the last arithmetic operation? If we're going to branch, uh, whether uh, with some future instruction, 
Uh, and then the instruction pointer, you may remember in 64-bit uh, is our RIP register uh, that has the address of the next instruction to execute, next instruction to execute. At this point, we're going to save these in temporary hardware registers because we don't yet, uh, we're not ready to put stuff into onto the kernel stack yet. And save these in temporary registers. We're going to switch to the kernel stack, and that's switching our stack pointer register to have the address of our, our kernel stack instead of our user stack. At this point, we can take these, the CPU state that were saved in temporary registers and actually push them to our kernel stack now that we have switched to using it. And at this point, we're ready to call the interrupt handler and start processing that interrupt in whatever way the system has set up to process it. Do these steps make sense? Questions on this? Victor? Uh, what kind of interrupt, uh, sorry, what kind of interrupt handler are we calling at the end? Uh, the handler for whatever interrupt has occurred. Uh -huh. So, could be handling a timer interrupt, uh -huh. uh, could be uh, handling a system call, mm -hmm. could be uh, handling an I.O. interrupt, like uh, the mouse moved or a key on the keyboard was pressed. Okay. Uh, it's whatever handler we look up in this mm -hmm. interrupt table. Thank you. Other questions? Where is the pointer that's pointing to the uh, user process stack and then the kernel stack? Where is that pointer existing? So this, st this stack pointer? Yeah. Uh, so it exists just, the one that we're currently using is just in a register on the CPU. And so whatever address is in that register, that determines what stack we're currently using. So at the start of this, we're already in kernel mode and must have like the permissions to access the kernel stack and all that. Yeah, so the, ins the instruction that got us here, as part of that, put us into kernel mode. And more about that shortly. Uh, is the kernel, like, where is the kernel stack in like our virtual memory? Is it in its own virtual memory or is it with the user's stack? Uh, the Kernel will have its own set of page tables, its own virtual memory. Okay. So like we have to switch so switching to the kernel stack is more than just changing RSP to the kernel stack's RSP. Uh yes, that's that's a good observation. The switching to the, the, the kernel stack uh, would also be switching the page table base register. Switching kind of the the data structure we use to get a physical address. Other questions? All right. I think I know what time it is. It's time for James K. Polk, <laughs> our 11th president. So we're back to uh, the Democratic Party. Polk was a, a protege of, of Andrew Jackson, uh, elected in, in 1844. Uh, he defeated the, the Whig candidate, Henry Clay. Uh, a brief, uh, brief digression about Henry Clay. Um, extremely notable political figure from this time. Uh, member of the House of Representatives and the Senate, prominent Whig. He ran for president four or five times, lost every time. 
Uh, this, I think, was his uh, final attempt in 1844. Um, and he is sort of the uh, a pivotal figure of US politics, repeatedly runs for president, uh, uh, never manages to, uh, to get there. Uh, but back to Polk. Um, Polk basically promised two things when he ran for president. He said, I'm going to take Texas from Mexico, and I'm going to serve for one term. He indeed kept both of those promises. He provoked a war with Mexico, uh, uh, annexed Texas, um, and then uh, forced Mexico to give up uh, additional territory, um, and was general in general had a very kind of territorial expansionist uh, view. Uh, he uh, negotiated the, the treaty that determined the border between the U.S. and, and Canada and the Northwest. Um, however, territorial expansion during this time was uh, one of the, uh, the the most um, one of the most politically divisive uh, topics because it concerned the expansion of slavery and which new territory would allow slaves, which wouldn't. Uh, Polk was a slave owner himself and was seen as a proponent of the expansion of slavery. Uh, and, and at this point, the, the sort of regional divisions over slavery are uh, intensifying. And uh, in a couple uh, less than, than two decades, we'll, we'll bring the country to, to civil war. Uh, but Polk, notable for... Uh, the, the short list of, of promises made, which, which he did indeed keep. All right. So the thing that I want to finish up with is uh, a diagram of, of how a system call happens that I think will help make this whole process a little more concrete. So here we are in user code, some say main method, and user code calls a function to open a file. And the user code calls this just like it would call any other function. The call instruction address of this file open. And this will take us to this file open function, which you call a user stub, meaning that this is going to be uh, a little function that does uh, very simple things. It's going to move uh, move some constant associated with the system call open into RAX, or, uh, or maybe push it on the, onto the stack, but basically set up some specific constant related to the system call that's happening, and then execute uh, the interrupt instruction with the index into our interrupt table that corresponds to our system call handler. And then after and then after that it returns. This uh, this interrupt causes the trap, changes us from user mode into kernel mode. 
and sends us over to a kernel stub function, which is the things you're implementing in lab one. So we might think of this as kind of a handler for the file open syscall. And it's going to copy the arguments into its own memory. That's the kind of fetch argument function you're using in the lab. Uh, it's going to validate the arguments uh, and then call the kernel's implementation of this uh, system call and OSV, these are like fs file open, and this sends us up into this function. So this was step one, two, three. We're now executing this file open function is actually doing the work of opening the file, checking file permissions, maybe creating a new file, uh, whatever it is. Eventually this finishes and returns back to this kernel stub. This will copy a return value into user memory. This isn't something you have to explicitly do in the lab. You're just returning something, but uh, the kind of whole uh, trap infrastructure copies this value into user memory. And then this returns. Step five, we get back to our user stub. We resume the instruction after the one that we left off. So we'll resume at this return. And that finally sends us back into uh, our, our user code itself. So on step two here is when we did the mode train is when we did mode, we went from user mode to kernel mode. And step five, we went from kernel back to user mode in terms of kind of which mode the, the, the CPU was, was running. Uh, it is the, is, can you call in 64 from your own user code? And if so, can't you spam the kernel with stuff that is going to be pausing its own like checking for interrupts? Because when you call your own interrupt, it pauses the uh, other interrupts from occurring. So, uh, yes, we, we do the trigger, triggering an, in, an, an interrupt is, is an instruction we need to be able to execute in user mode uh, in order to cause an interrupt to happen. Uh, could, a, uh, uh, could a bad actor uh, just constantly interrupt um, and uh, keep going into an interrupt handler uh, that seems uh, like a, a program could do that, but kind of in between the interrupts, timer, like if a timer interrupt occur occurred during the processing of one interrupt, it would be delayed, but then happen as soon as that interrupt was over. And so this would process would actually be, would, would be context switched out. So yeah, I, I think, you can, you can design all sorts of processes that would bog the system down, but it wouldn't be able to, to lock, totally lock it up or, or something like that. Other questions? 
All right. I, uh, yeah, so here's another kind of thought question for you uh, that, I, that I'd like you to, uh, to discuss with your, your neighbors. We have this whole complicated mechanism for causing a system call to happen. Uh, but why couldn't we just make a system call kind of in the normal way that we call uh, a function? So uh, a normal uh, function call, we have the call instruction, we give it the address of the first instruction of the function, it should start executing. This pushes a return address on the stack, switches our instruction pointer to this address, starts executing. So why couldn't we have kind of a syscall instruction? It's going to do this kind of give us user to kernel mode uh, that will just jump to some address that is the, the system call uh, uh, code that we want to execute. So why do we need to do uh, like could we do it this way? Is it unnecessary to do this whole thing where we like move some constant into a register and then do an interrupt and that's sort of an index into our uh, interrupt table? Could we just give it a specific address and say start a system call there? So Take a couple minutes, uh, discuss with your, your neighbors <coughs> what, what would be a problem with this. All right. Thoughts on why we couldn't get away with this call and give it, giving it the address to Well, you do like the attack thing we did in various systems where like, you give it halfway through a function you find like the, some bits you want to execute and you like give it the address of something that's like halfway through a function and cause the kernel to like do stuff, return back to you, then you give it another one that's like halfway through a function and splice together some like malicious code. Uh, yeah, our our open handler here is doing things like or, or this file open function, the actual implementation, doing things like does the user have permission to read this file? But exactly as Owen says, if we just give the kernel an address, we could give it the address in this function after the part that checks if the user has permission. And so we can just start executing partway through the system call having skipped over some uh, important uh, uh, security or, or validation or, or other code. Uh, and this gets to that limited entry into the kernel. We don't want the user process to be able to just go to any arbitrary point within the kernel code. We want these specific spots that it can enter through. And this mechanism here uh, sets up, OK, you have to start at the beginning of a s entire uh, uh, system call function. Does that make sense? Other, other thoughts? All right, uh, last couple minutes, want to show you that uh, everything I've talked about here actually exists <laughs> in OSV uh, that you are modifying. So our kind of open function that is called in, in user mode uh, is declared here with these types, but what is actually called is set up in this assembly file, uh, usyscall.s, where we say for each system call, so for open, we're going to move some constant associated with that system call uh, into rx, or eax in this case, and then execute an interrupt. Where do these numbers come from? Well, another header file, each system call is simply given a number. So kind of index into the various system calls. Uh, and this t system call 
is defined as uh, 64, which is the convention uh, on x86. And then at the bottom of the syscall.c file that you are editing is the syscall function that once we transfer it into kernel mode actually gets called with the number of the system call, one of these numbers, and a pointer to the arguments that were being passed in. And this looks up in this array syscalls using this number as an index. And this array syscalls also defined in this file, this big thing up here, big array of function pointers. So it just sets up a big array where the thing at index says open, points to the function sys open. And so OSV indeed has to implement kind of all pieces of this picture here to make uh, system calls and, and other interrupts work. All right, that's it for today. Uh, keep working on lab one, keep asking questions uh, on Slack or on the forums. I have office hours tomorrow night in the lab and I will see you Friday.